I've been studying a beautiful honeybee tradition in England for the last nine years or so. Maybe my math is wrong, but um, many years ago when I experienced a beautiful heartbreak, um, the, the man of, of that heartbreak gifted me on parting a book called The Shamanic Way of the Bee. And I said, this book is about you. I had no interest in bees. Honestly, I didn't really even like honey growing up. I don't know why. Um, but it was true. The book was, uh, <laughs> I've said this so many times, but it's like that last scene at the end of The Never Ending Story where he like takes the book and throws it across the room because he's like, no, it can't be real. <laughs> I had that experience um, with this book. Uh, multiple not times knowing what was coming next when I turned the page in, in ways that I should not have known. And um, I knew that I had to go to England and I had to find these people and learn more about the way of the Melissae and uh, the old priestess hoods, Melissae meaning uh, honeybee, part of um, ancient priestess hoods, going back to the Hellenistic era in Greece. And um, while I did end up over there, and while I was over there, a hive of wild bees moved into the wall behind my bed, the outer wall of my house. So I came home from my introduction to bee wisdom and feminine bee magic, and bees had moved in. <laughs> so now I was sleeping with bees on the other side of the wall. I decided that I'd uh, become a beekeeper the following year, and built a beautiful hive that is now my hive that I have with me. At that point it wasn't painted, it was just a sweet wooden hive. And I built it in the winter, and that same winter I conceived and um, spent the early spring months pregnant, uh, preparing to become a beekeeper and to become a mother. And uh, from February to April I had a really beautiful, profound experience. And then uh, in April, I miscarried, and it was a very serious miscarriage. So I was hospitalized, um, and I had to have surgery. And when I came out of that surgery, I was very, um, very heartbroken. I understood on a deep, deep level what had happened, but on an emotional, <laughs> mother, body, animal level, I was um, shattered. And it, uh, it, it really took me down to the bone. And I, uh, I had what I would call a, a bleed out for a long time. Even though I had stopped bleeding, I just kept energetically bleeding out. And I couldn't, I didn't know what to do. And I buried the, what, what was left, what they would release from the hospital 
under an empty beehive and prayed to the spirit of the child that had been with me to bring me bees so I could be a mother. And uh, one week later, after the miscarriage, um, it's three days after I buried the remains, uh, I got a call from out of the blue and there was a swarm in an apple tree. Apple trees have always been very special to me. I read a song about them um, once. And in the tree there was a heart-shaped swarm. Mm. And I went and caught the swarm and I learned by watching YouTube videos. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I, I had barely read any books. I had gone to one beautiful class by Serge Labesque and another class with Mikhail Thiel of Gaia Bees and other than that, nothing. And uh, became a bee tender. Um, and really just, they healed me. They, the, the focus and attention that's required to be with the bees and the frequency of them as a organism that expresses love and abundance and fertility um, was paramount in physically healing me and emotionally healing me. And so, I am forever grateful to that little being that came to me for a few months because she set me down my path. So I have found myself uh, in some ways unintentionally slipping into this niche of, of supporting women as beekeepers uh, just by starting as one and being a woman with a womb and going through the suffering of what it is to start to become a mother and then lose that that connection and it just, it's just sent me down this path of really supporting women in their relationship to their own bodies and one of those ways is to connect deeper with bees because they are they, they drop us in so deeply into an altered state of awareness and a focused state of consciousness, a Zen mind. We really have to be present and in our bodies. And as we deepen into the lore around bees and around their connection to the feminine and the womb, we, we invariably have to look at our own. So what I see myself doing in my work is really helping women reclaim their their womb as their seat of gnosis, knowledge, intuition, and the place from which the voice arises. And they can, and then, and then also on the other side, through that deeper listening, learning to interact with bees differently. And so it has this benefiting the bees and benefiting women, and I think that women might be the thing that, sa that, that saves the bees, if we're gonna play with that language of saving the bees. And I don't know if they need saving so much as being listened to. Um, it's the, you know, just, that's complex. But they definitely need to be supported and I do not want to live in a world without them. Um, but it might be women because, because of this cultivation of a different way and a different way of listening and a tuning in Look at the amount of herbalists out there in the world right now reclaiming lots lost arts that they were burned for and shunned for uh, the, the midwives and the herbalists and the women as beekeepers are Reclaiming that sacred relationship to the earth, and I think it's really supporting men. We live in a um, Beekeeping world like any other industry that is male dominant and I have met some incredible male beekeepers, but um I've also really encountered the old boys club that's very opinionated and uh, likes to treat me like a cute little girl who's playing at beekeeping and really has some very strong feelings about what we do to bees and how to do it versus what we can learn from bees. This is not black and white. It doesn't mean all men are, are I'm, not, I'm not trying to condemn men, I'm just saying that I think that the, the woman's capacity to learn to listen from the earth and from the body, to reclaim her sovereignty to her own womb, 
which means to reclaim her sovereignty to her own sexuality and life force energy, is incredibly powerful towards creating right relationship with the planet. And bees, again, are, are a keystone, a bridge species towards doing that. I'm really stoked on the women out there doing amazing work, like Jacqueline Freeman, um, uh, um, Hillary. Uh, I, Instagram is such a weird thing. So, um, <laughs> girl next door, honey, and uh, just so many incredible women working with bees and learning to work with them. And here's a funny, just practical thing, but it's actually there are many very strong women with amazing upper body muscles, but. Women's center of gravity, right, is, a, is um, different than men's. So it's actually for some women, particularly, um, well, just I'll just say, yeah, for some women it's easier to work with hives that aren't these giant hundred pound stacks of boxes that they're having to get forklifts to lift up, off. Um, working with smaller cavities, working with rewilding bees and, and trees, working with um, even you know more narrow warre hives, this kind of natural beekeeping movement that's happening with women, more and more women getting out there being interested in that, um, keeping bees in their backyards, relating to the garden. It's, it's just so fascinating to watch that happen and watch that like quite physically, that it, some of those hive styles are more conducive to at least this the wombic center of gravity i'll say it that way well That's there are many body types <laughs> many body types but yeah the wombic center of gravity i think it's a really really interesting time to be born and alive on our planet and it's an interesting thing to have fallen so in love with a creature that is showing us the great transformations our planet is experiencing through a myriad of causes but ultimately, in my opinion, through the forgetting and divorcing ourselves from our animal nature in its true sense and our relationship to the earth. And that cannot be addressed, in my opinion, without addressing the loss of the sacred feminine. We live in a culture that is a culture of patriarchy. That doesn't mean that we're, uh, that I would be anti-men. Um, and it doesn't mean that patriarchy is over there and it's just affecting me. It means that I am a product of it and I am having to deconstruct it within myself in all of the ways that I am incongruent with the natural impulse and life force of harmony on this planet. I do believe in that oh so kind of overused and, and um, I don't know how to say it, but I, you know, I believe love is, is the binder um, of all things. And when we, when we lose our connection with the wild and with relationship to the planet and relationship to that feminine creative energy that is life force coming up that is is needs the masculine it's not that we need to get rid of the masculine it's that there's a there's a loss in our understanding of the feminine and honoring the feminine and that's seen through cultural and societal um, harms and the subjugation of women and the oppressing of the creative life force of the human being in the sense of those with the womb. And that is played out in our relationship to nature. And it is so poetically and very fiercely 
and very tragically experienced as well within our relationship to the honeybee, which at her, at her core is feminine in nature. That is why there were cults dedicated to, and when I say cult, I don't mean it in our more modern sense, <laughs> but in the, in the sense of sacred priestesshoods that were called the Melissae. The honeybee has been throughout various cultures. Remember that Apis mellifera, the honeybee, is a European. We, we brought her over here. <laughs> so mm -hmm. Apis mellifera, there are other species of bee, but the honeybee that we work with is Apis mellifera. So she's European in origin. And um, throughout Europe, there are so many different cultures that view and see the honeybee as an in-between creature. She moves between the darkness of the womb and then gives birth to herself in the spring. And from within that wombic chamber comes life-giving ambrosia for humans and for the bee. And on top of that, she makes love to the flowers and she is completely in touch with her own eros. And through that we have abundance and food. It's a really powerful, saturated, sexual, in its most beautiful and pure sense, relationship to the feminine and to the life-giving force. And these, the, you know, the honeybee moves in and out of the darkness and the light. She moves in and out of what, and throughout different cultures, the spirit realm and this physical realm. So the honeybee was seen as she who brought the new souls to the planet, and she who escorted the psychopomp, who escorted souls when they died to the other side or through the veil, and that she could bring messages between. She was also seen to have come from the stars in some legends, particularly from the Pleiades, so the seven sisters of the seven bees, and inhabited the space between the earth and the heavens. So she is, she is this in-between and she comes to us at this 11th hour, this in-between time of flux where our ability to sustain life for the human species and many of the species on the planet is in question and is very certainly threatened. It doesn't take, I don't have to tell you that, go look at all the science around it. Um, and she comes to us say, saying we're dying. And she's asking us to witness that. And here we have all of these brilliant minds trying to solve the honeybee crisis, the colony collapse, and the varroa mite that's bringing in the you know parasitic, a disease and whatnot, and we have all, everyone trying to figure out how to save the honeybee in these very um, well-funded studies. Meanwhile, we still spread poison all over our plants in the form of pesticides, and and yet no one's at really asking her. So we forget, we forget again and again the nature of being in relationship. It's just like, you know. <laughs> Not to get super political, but <laughs> you know the classic male scientists and male doctors figuring out how to control the female reproductive system through everything from drugged births, and I don't mean the kind now. I mean the you know what used to happen in the 50s to sterilizations, to birth control, to research not not being there for men and their reproductive experience this suppression of life force energy uh, not to mention the physical traumas that the collective womb of this planet has experienced through its dominant species which is the humans you know we we perceive ourselves and have the biggest effect Although I don't know, there could be all sorts of things going on underneath the surface of other dominant species that will soon show us what's <laughs> up. But nonetheless, you know, here we have this collective trauma. So we have the rape of the earth and we have the, the uh, subjugation of women and we have the mechanization of beekeeping and it, I can't see it as different. So for me, the answer then becomes, how do I unlearn 
how do I learn to listen instead to my body of wisdom, physically, intuitively? How do I learn to listen to the bees as a result? And what they're showing us again and again is you have to look at death. You have to be willing to look her in the eye. You have to get comfortable with death. And then you have to look at life and fertility and abundance and let it be so and learn how to support that without fearing death. Someone said to a friend of mine recently, who's a beekeeper, well, don't worry if all the honeybees die. Scientists will just invent a pollinator. And they might. They might invent a pollinator that's more prolific than the honeybees, maybe. But how could you possibly be okay with letting that kind of beauty pass from this earth? You're here and you're watching this because you're fascinated by bees and you may be a beekeeper or want to become a beekeeper and it's sort of like this giant overwhelming abyss of which direction to turn to and how do I get involved and how do I treat them right and how, how, how and where, where, where. Um, a few things I like to say as a little goodbye for your experience. Um, start with your garden. Start with a garden. Maybe it's not your house. Maybe it's a friend's property. Start planting for bees. Don't put bees in a place where there isn't food. Give them food. And find a hive. Go sit next to it. And introduce yourself. Tell them who you are. Tell them your story. And then maybe just sit back. Breathe into your body. And listen. Start there. Start with that relationship. It's been a relationship that's been cultivated for thousands of years, so I don't think you can go wrong with a little bit of conversation.